All right, we're recording. <laughs> so it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Um, Dr. Tiffany Haynes is a clinical psychologist, researcher, and mental health advocate who focuses on improving access to mental health services in underserved communities. Dr. Haynes is an associate professor in the Health Behavior and Health Education Department and the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Faye W. Boozman College of Public Health at UAMS. She also serves as the director of UAMS Translational Research Institute's Community Engagement Corps. Her current projects include two NIMHD-funded Hybrid II implementation trials. The first focuses on testing the effectiveness of faith-based mental health intervention, and the second focuses on testing the impact of providing alcohol screening and brief interventions in barbershops. A renowned speaker and educator, uh, Dr. Haynes seeks to improve our understanding of emotional health and decrease stigma through the sharing of personal stories. Our second speaker for today will be Dr. Katie Allison, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education in UAMS's College of Public Health and core faculty of the Rural Telehealth Evaluation Center in the UAMS Institute for Digital Health and Innovation. She received her PhD in Health Promotion and Prevention Research and her Master of Public Health from UAMS. And in 2021, she completed the NIDA T32 Fellowship in Translational Addiction Research at PRI. Specializing in implementation science and qualitative research, her research centers on studying implementation of technology-based interventions, prevention education, and mental health services in settings that reach individuals in crisis, like emergency departments and criminal justice settings. And then finally, uh, Jennifer Gan Kemp. Um, will present. So she is the program administrator for the DEI core in the UAMS Winthrop P. Rockefeller Cancer Institute. She's a research instructor as well in the UAMS Department of Medical Humanities and Bioethics and affiliate faculty in the Center for Health Literacy. She's also a facilitator for the UAMS Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity Program and uh, the Office of Intercultural Education and in UAMS's Office of Interprofessional Education. Jen is originally from California and has lived in rural Southwest Arkansas. She has over 20 years of clinical educational program and clinical research administrative experience in academic medical centers. So um, today's presentation, like I said, is going to be this compilation of speakers. We're going to start off with um, an introduction to community-based participatory research by Dr. Haynes. We'll transition then into uh, an example of a uh, two CBPR studies that are focused on suicide prevention. Dr. Allison will present, and then uh, Jen Gann will present. And then we'll come back and wrap around to describe the community engagement re uh, resources that um, the center, the Translational Research Institute has more we'll back around to Dr. Haynes. So um, that is it for the introductions. Dr. Haynes, it is off to you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak with you today about community engagement. Um, there's no way that I can give you a really deep dive into community engagement in the time we have today. So I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible so we can get to our examples. But since we just finished with the holiday season, I want you to think about a time when you got a gift and you were you know, with somebody and they really thought about giving you a gift and you received that gift. And you said, oh, this is really nice because, you know, we're good Southerners and we know how to be polite. But you took that gift and it ended up in your closet, in the trunk of your car. It ended up, you know, under the bed because you really actually didn't have a use for it or you really didn't really want it, but you didn't know how to say hey, keep this and don't give it to me so I, I don't have it in my house. So you took it, it was nice, but it wasn't very useful. Well, well, that's what we sometimes do as researchers. We have great ideas. We really say, this is going to change the world. If we can only get this project going, people are going to be emotionally healthy for the rest of their life. And we do this work and then we get to our community, our end users, our participants, our, our clients, and they say, this was really nice of you. Thank you for all of this, but it's put on the shelf because we haven't really gotten to what that's relevant to them. So one of the ways that we can start making sure that we're getting gifts or research projects or you know, even uh, clinical services that are gonna be really relevant is to think about community engagement. So I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully this is gonna go smoothly. All right. So um, we're gonna talk about what community engagement is. And so there's lots of different um, definitions, but the one that we use from NIHCTSAs is that it's the process of working collaboratively with and through groups of people. 
And these are people who are grouped together because they have similar interests or similar situations. But I really want you to focus on that working collaboratively with. That means that we're not just going and saying, hey, this is what we're going to do, but we're sitting down at the table. Everyone has a piece of that puzzle, if you see that picture, and we're using everyone's pieces of the puzzle to get the work done. Now, you may say that's really great, but why is this even important? And so it is important because for us, for researchers, it helps build relationships and trust. And so when you think about really what is important in research and what's important in improving health, we have found that trust is very important. Um, so when we're having relationships and trust, we're able to work with our community. We're able to uh, make sure that we are increasing the relevance of our research. So we're making sure it's not just on the shelf, there's actually something that's useful for them. But it also helps us be able to have better research questions, better design, better recruitment materials. And so I will tell you one of the ways that this works is that we had a way, way long ago a study where we're talking about mental health. We go into the community and we were like, we had a cab and we're talking to them about mental health. And then all of a sudden, we're using the words mental health. And all of a sudden, one of our cab members says, I don't know anything about mental health. I can't help you help other people with mental health. I don't know what that is. And we had to go back and say, oh, the words that we are using is actually a barrier to research because they were saying that when they hear mental health, they think of the extreme end of severe mental illness. And they were like, I don't know anything about that. Therefore, I can't be helpful. So sometimes even in having no collaborative relationships, it's not just about the design, but it even helps us uh, know what words do we use? What's the language that we need to use? And what are those questions that are going to be important? But it's also important for our community members because it allows them to have research that's going to be more focused on what they think is important. So they is more relevant. And when it's more relevant, they're more engaged or more likely to participate. And they're more likely to be engaged and want to see the sustain and go on in their community. It also helps them build capacity for how they can make change in their own community and it increases their access to resources and opportunities. And if that's not enough of a reason for you to think that engagement is important, we know that funders are increasingly asking for community engagement in their projects. And so uh, agencies such as FACORIA, NIH, CDC have sections where they're asking specifically for engagement. So um, this is important not just to us, for our community, but also for the people who are funding us. So I hope I have you on board to saying that this is important, but now you're saying, what does this look like? And so community engagement, we think of it as a spectrum. And it should start on one end of the spectrum where we're just talking about outreach, where the flow of information and the flow of uh, what we're doing is coming from us and going out. So we, outreach is when we're giving information. So you've seen that before is when we have the booths at the uh, fairs and we go out and we do a talk about what it is that we're doing. That's outreach and it's going to the community. But as we move down the spectrum, we move to where we're involving community more, we're hearing their voice, we're getting their feedback, and we're incorporating what it is that they're talking about into what we do. So that can be just consulting where we have a one-time opportunity to hear from our community or maybe one or two times. And uh, so those are things like our CRBs that I'll talk a little bit about later where we get a chance to consult with the community. And then sometimes we have a all the way up to collaboration, where we're having more bi-directional uh, communication. That may be our cabs or uh, other advisory boards where we have constant communication with them and we're giving them information, but they're also giving us information about what's going on in the community and how we need to be changing that. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have where we have a shared leadership. And that's where we're going to have two uh, entities working together, our academic teams and our community uh, teams working together to make all the decisions. But it really gives a lot more of the power to our community. They're making decisions about what we're researching, how we're going to research it, where does the money go, what are the outcomes that are important to us. They're involved in every aspect of research, every aspect of what it is that we're doing. So outreach is when the information is just coming from us to the community. And when we go to the other end of the spectrum, it's where we are working together collaboratively and we're sharing decision making. And one of the ways on the end of the spectrum when we're doing shared leadership is about CBPR or um, our community-based participatory research. And this is, again, you see that word collaborative. Uh, we're not talking about just us having someone there for eye candy or window dressing, but we're actually a relationship where we're talking back and forth in collaboration. But it's a collaborative research approach where we're including the communities that are dealing with this issue. So if we're talking about depression, we want people who are in our study, we want people on our board that know what depression is because they've lived with it or they've been affected by it. And again, they are involved in all the aspects of the research process from when we uh, say, what are we gonna research to when we get ready to disseminate the information. 
And so now, you know, we could talk about CBPR, but it really gets real when we talk about what it looks like in practice. So I'm going to uh, ask Dr. Katie Allison to give us a little bit of an example about what CBPR looks like in action. Thank you, Dr. Haynes. I'm going to take over your screen share if that's all right. Okay, and if you all can see my screen. Okay. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here today and talk about a project that we have um, had going on for um, a while now. So uh, this is an example of a CBPR approach to an implementation study. Um, specifically, we're studying the implementation of suicide prevention education in Arkansas jails. So this is not my project. This really has been a team effort. Um, this is a project that's led by Dr. Melissa Zelensky, who you all know, um, as well as in collaboration with um, some of our partners with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And so um, Ms. Susie Reese, who's here today, um, she's our committee chair for the, um, the Project 2025, and I'll tell you what that is, um, our Suicide and Corrections um, Committee. And then uh, Ms. Jacqueline Sharp, who is our area director in Arkansas for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So this project was really uh, born out of um, uh, national priorities. So the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention several years back um, decided on four priority areas um, to focus on um, in their goals for, for 2025. And correction systems was one of those. Um, recognizing that um, being incarcerated is a time of increased risk for suicide. Um, suicide is actually the leading cause of death in jails in the United States. And um, two corrections officers are, it's a profession that's at increased risk for suicide. Um, so there's really a need to focus on um, promoting prevention practices in this setting. So in 2019, we formed a committee here in Arkansas. Um, we have had uh, stakeholders and representatives from um, many different kind of sectors. So we've had folks that, that do suicide prevention um, work in education. Um, and community organizing. We've had folks from the National um, uh, Foundation as well as our um, folks from our, our local chapter in Arkansas and um, others that are doing suicide prevention in, in different settings. So not necessarily correction settings, but have um, prevention programs in, in other ways. Um, also our corrections partners are so important. So folks that are in leadership and work in prisons and jails across the state, um, as well as uh, agencies at the state level. Um, and then there's researchers. So those of us who do research and um, participate in this committee, um, but we really recognize we needed all of these folks to come together to, to talk about um, what's needed in this corrections setting um, to promote suicide prevention. And I, I wanted to point out too that when we formed this committee in 2019, this actually wasn't the, the first time that we had worked together. So some of us had um, started collaborating as early as 2012. That's when I got involved in this in suicide prevention efforts across the state. Um, there's been a really robust uh, program uh, in Garland County for the past decade um, that Susie Reese has led. And um, the, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention forming these committees in 2019 kind of kickstarted our, our focus on uh, prevention in correction settings. Um, but it was really in 2021, our participation in the, the TRI CBPR Scholars Program that got us as a group to start thinking about research. How, how could we do research together? Um, and then, um, the TRI Pilot Award um, that we started just last year. But I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our experience with the CBPR Scholars Program. And I know Dr. Haynes will tell you a little bit more about it um, in, the, in a minute, but um, participating in this program, it's a year long program. It really gave us um, the opportunity, um, researchers and community partners to come together and learn, learn together about CBPR. Um, it gave us the structure and some tools that we needed to collaboratively write research aims and, and write a research proposal. Um, we um, utilized a lot of TRI resources, like um, they helped us uh, put together a community review board of, of folks who work in prisons and jails that could help us inform our research aims. And um, so before we started this study, we had their voices at the table um, to inform our methods and our aims. And then two, Dr. Zelensky has a, a, a community advisory board of formerly incarcerated women that um, had, gave us really valuable feedback on our proposal. Um, and that community advisory board has, you know, 
given uh, Dr. Zelensky uh, feedback on lots of, if not all of her research projects that are related to corrections. Um, and then too, if you participate in the CBPR Scholars Program, you have the opportunity to apply for um, one of their pilot grants that is focused on CBPR. And uh, we did, and we were awarded that funding. Um, but this program really got us thinking as a group, what are our, uh, our priorities? Why, why did we want to do research together? And um, one of those kind of reasons was that we wanted to increase capacity um, for both co our community members and our researchers um, on our team to collaborate and do this partnered research um, in the area of suicide prevention in correction settings. And, and to really learn how to collaborate um, to identify um, and pilot test strategies for implementing suicide prevention education in county jails. This also, this project came at a um, kind of a, a good time because the National Foundation was, um, they, they were working on tailoring a education module that they've had for years. So Talk Saves Lives is an education program that, that the foundation has had for a long time now, but they tailored it for correction settings, really realizing that um, we could use brief education to equip um, officers in this setting to recognize warning signs, risk factors, and um, to, uh, uh, you know, lean on their resources to to understand their policies for, for suicide prevention. Um, and they, uh, the National Foundation, they uh, helped uh, facilitate, helped us uh, get a trainer to Arkansas to train some of our, our corrections officers. Um, but first, I want to just give you a little bit more background on the, the research study. So we, uh, together with our community partners, with our committee, um, developed these specific aims. Um, first, we wanted, through stakeholder input, to um, work together to develop strategies um, that might work to implement suicide prevention education in jails, and then pilot test it um, in two county jails in Arkansas. Um, but also to determine, um, you know, the facilitators and barriers to doing this work. So we wanted to know what works and what doesn't so that we might be able to share our findings with other jails in Arkansas, um, but um, also with the rest of the country. So our methods for these aims, um, for the first one, we um, disseminated a brief survey to uh, the jail administrators across the state um, just to get more information about um, their jails, the size of them, and how they've been impacted by suicide, um, but also to get their feedback on um, a preliminary package of implementation strategies. And um, we wanted to know what they thought um, before we moved forward with kind of formalizing um, the, the package of strategies. And then two, we used a process called evidence-based quality improvement, where we engaged a series of um, kind of panel sessions, panel discussions, um, with key stakeholders at our at our facilities um, to kind of come to a consensus on what the package of strategies should look like um, and then use that to pilot test it at the two jails. Um, when we pilot test it, we uh, use pre and post surveys to assess implementation outcomes like acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility, um, we're documenting costs. And then we are going to um, conduct some stakeholder interviews to find out what went well and what didn't go well and use that to inform an implementation guide. So this is really an example of, of how we are using CBPR principles and an approach in implementation science. And uh, kind of the beauty of implementation science is that there are um, you know, established and evidence-based um, uh, tools and processes, and their validated measures to um, assess implementation outcomes. And so I listed here just a few that we're using. Um, like I mentioned, you know, to develop the strategies, we're using this evidence-based quality improvement process that our folks here at the Center for Implementation Research at UMS are experts in, and they've been incredibly helpful in guiding us in that process. Um, you know, we're using validated measures um, to assess outcomes like acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility. Um, and we are using a uh, determinants framework um, called the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Science to guide our interview um, process. Um, so these are just really tangible um, you know, tools and, and processes that you can use if you're wanting to study um, the implementation of any type of innovation um, in mental health. I also wanted to just mention uh, that our community advisory board, our committee that's um, served as our community advisory board has been um, so important in this process. 
Um, so they're really informing all aspects of our research process. So they were there when we were, you know, putting together a proposal. Um, they are at the table when we um, talk about recruitment strategies, when we decide on research methodologies, um, you know, when, when we are going through this evidence-based quality improvement process to identify these implementation strategies. Um, and they really helped us to make new collaborations. Sometimes we realize that not everyone's at the table and we need to form new partnerships. Um, but uh, I want to point out, you know, this is really shared decision making. We are not just getting their feedback and then going back to our offices and making these decisions. We are making decisions alongside our community partners. And um, so the decisions are made in these meetings. Um, we are just one of the many people. Um, we as the research team are just one of the, the folks that are part of that process. And I quickly wanted to give you just uh, some of our um, early results from this project. So we are about, I think, 10 months into a year long project, but um, we've disseminated our survey. We got responses from 65 um, jails in Arkansas, which we thought was um, pretty great. Um, so these were all the jail administrators, the leadership at um, jails, and we got a good mix of folks at different size jails. And some are really tiny and some are really large in Arkansas. Um, but most of the folks who, who participated in the survey were involved in education in some way at their facility. Um, some were the primary training officer. Um, the, we, we expected to see that everyone would say that they um, had received suicide prevention training because it is a state mandate for um, corrections officers to receive an hour of suicide prevention training um, each year, but uh, we didn't see that. So um, we, you know, think it's, a, it kind of speaks to the importance of our project that, um, you know, we're not seeing 100% say that they've been trained. Um, and two, we um, realized from the survey that some of these facilities have been impacted by suicide, either a loss of an inmate or detainee or um, a staff member, um, an officer um, in the past couple of years. So this graphic you're seeing on the left, this is just a uh, quick kind of uh, graphic we made to outline our kind of core package of strategies that we were using early on. And we wanted to know what these jail administrators thought of it. Did they think this was gonna be helpful and feasible in their setting um, to help get suicide prevention training off the ground? Um, and most said, yeah, uh, that this would be feasible. And then we actually went through and had them rate um, the uh, long list of potential implementation strategies to help us um, when we went to our um, panel of stakeholders um, to see, okay, like these are what the jail administrators think are helpful. Um, when we think about logistically, what does that look like? Um, how, how can we um, prioritize these even further um, and come up with a, a doable package of implementation strategies? And we, um, we worked with both of our pilot facilities, so the Pulaski County Juvenile Detention Center and the Garland County Detention Center um, in Hot Springs, and they came up with similar but not identical implementation um, plans. Um, they were um, uh, a little bit different um, in that Garland County has a, a different kind of staffing structure because they're larger. They have um, a, a designated person or two that, that do training in their facility and um, Pulaski County doesn't have that because they're smaller. So um, some, some differences like that um, were important in our approach to training um, their, uh, their trainers. So we actually held a train the trainer um, because they decided they wanted internal people to be able to facilitate this education. So not relying on an external person to come in and do this um, periodically or annually. They wanted people that worked there to, to facilitate um, this training. So we uh, trained six people total at these two sites. Um, and then it was up to them to pilot it, to, to actually do the training for their staff. And we have um, seen that one of our facilities has trained everyone, which was amazing. They got it done so quickly. And our other facility is planning to incorporate it in their, their annual in-service. Um, in a couple of months. So we are still in the process of, of assessing our pre and post um, outcomes. Um, so more to come, but um, we also will be conducting qualitative interviews with, with lots of stakeholders um, to identify you know, what went well and what didn't go well so that we can um, make good recommendations for um, other jails um, to, to use this, this education. Um, we hope to then um, take it and test it in more jails um, in Arkansas as well as across the country. But really, you know, some key takeaways from our core team um, 
about this process of doing a CBPR um, study, you know, that input from our CAB, from our committee, has been truly invaluable. Um, having them at the table and, and helping us make decisions um, has been so helpful in making sure that, you know, this is a successful project. Um, we also found it important that, you know, we're transparent with the communication. So um, we've used virtual tools like, like Google Drive and Box to make sure that everyone has access to all the information. So they share information with us that way and we share it back. Um, we also realized too uh, that virtual community engagement is possible. You know, we met in person in 2019 and um, for obvious reasons in 2020, we stopped meeting for a short period of time, but we really picked up where we left off using Zoom um, in 2021 and have found that we have been able to engage even more stakeholders than before because um, we get in a bad habit of having all of our meetings in Little Rock and, and now we can actually engage uh, folks, you know, I think some are as far as Bella Vista, like we're engaging folks across the state and they can uh, be at the table and it not be such a burden to get to our meetings. And then to um, our core team, just having constant communication um, throughout the, the, the research study has been helpful. We have weekly touch point meetings and we, uh, again, we, we use resources like Google Drive and, and Box um, to share information. And, and that's been um really critical in helping move this project forward in a short amount of time. But two, I know that Dr. Haynes is going to cover a lot of, of TRA resources for community engagement, but we have used so many of them and they've been so wonderful. Um, again, the, scho the Scholars Program is so great. I know they're uh, currently taking applications for folks who are interested. I think you can scan the QR code right now if you want to, um, but really uh, absolutely recommend um, finding, you know, community partners that are, are interested in, in forming a team because it was a great experience. Um, but we've also used, you know, their consultation service. You can request a consultation on their website. Um, uh, they have resources to help you form a community review board to, to say, you know, maybe you just want a one-time group of stakeholders to review your research methods or something. They can help you do that. Um, they also can in, in advise you on engaging a community advisory board that's ongoing. Um, they can also help connect you to the folks who can review your research design and your statistical analysis plans. Um, and then two, there are lots of opportunities to apply for pilot awards. And we've been so lucky um, to have our CVPR pilot award this year um, because it's helped uh, fund the study and helped us you know, compensate our community partners for their um, their efforts and their expertise on this project. So just quickly want to acknowledge TRI. Absolutely, they're so great and we're appreciative for them funding the study and our partners with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and then our local partners with the committee and Dr. Zelensky and her um, research team in the HEALS lab um, could not do it without them. And so I think I now will turn it over to uh, Jen and we'll take questions uh, at the end. Thank you so much, Katie, um, Alice, Dr. Allison, for that presentation. And I really appreciate the opportunity for to be able to present. Um, um, I am filling in for Dr. Eva Woodward, who is unfortunately unable to be here. She is the lead academic researcher on, oh, is that the right screen? Sure, there you go. Um, she's a lead researcher on this project. So my name is Jen Gan Kemp, and I'll be presenting on our um, partnership with the Arkansas Freedom Fund. They're a nonprofit organization that supports veterans and their families. And we've been meeting with them regularly um, since August of 2020. So we are losing about 17 veterans daily to suicide. Mostly, uh, most of them are not using the VA healthcare system. And suicide rates among veterans has increased 48% over the last 20 years. And that's double of um, the urban veterans. So our lead academic researcher, uh, Dr. Eva Woodward, she is a clinical psychologist um, and also um, study uses implementation science um, and focuses on health equity. So implementation science uses evidence-based interventions and implementation strategies to address barriers. So through these discussions, um, with through discussions with our community partners and the scientific literature, we did um, focus on marginalized subgroups. So looking at rural women and black veterans. So we were accepted into the CBPR scholars program in January of 2021. 
So they provided a lot of resources um, for grant development, and we learned um, about the CBPR process together with our community members. Um, we learned we incorporated what we learned from the TRI supported um, community review board into our grant submission. And that was a very valuable experience. And it was great to have them do the coordination and the facilitation of those sessions. So and we also um, rented um, an iPad and hotspot from their equipment store, which was very helpful, um, especially because we had um, community members who live in rural areas of the state where broadband is not cur um, currently available. And then as a um, group, we decided to submit a proposal based on all, all of our prior experiences, backgrounds, as well as considering the needs of the community and our institutions. So our first pro um, our project, which is adapting safety planning intervention for veterans to be delivered outside healthcare settings in rural areas was funded by TRI. Um, and here's a list of our current core research team members. So um, in safety planning um, um, intervention and lethal means counseling, they are effective um, prevention interventions. They're evidence-based and a one-time meeting and an easy sixth step safety plan. So the last step in the safety plan involves lethal means counseling, and which is key in this because 68% of the veteran suicides occur by firearm. And the risk for firearm suicides for rural veterans is higher as well as having firearm ownership is greater in rural areas. And then among, uh, there was a study done and among veterans in the emergency department, safety planning interventions were associated with a 45% reduction in suicidal behavior. So again, looking at an evidence-based practice. Um, so uh, we chose to use peer-to-peer -peer modeling because veterans prefer to have um, discussions with their peers there's not enough healthcare staff, especially in rural areas, and prior studies have demonstrated positive feedback um, about their peers' ability to connect and to provide support. So there is currently a statewide initiative which is focused on peer-to-peer -peer interventions for reducing suicide, veteran suicide in Arkansas, and this is um, the governor's challenge. So these are our project aims. Some of the main research questions are, what barriers, facilitators, and rural veteran needs for implementing peer-to-peer -peer safety and a planning intervention in rural community settings? What are core functions of safety planning intervention and lethal means counseling? And what can be adapted? And then how could core functions of the safety planning intervention be adapted to be delivered by peers to veterans in the community settings? So to achieve AIM-1, we learn, are learning from veterans who have had um, uh, suicidal thoughts um, as, and have lived in rural Arkansas, and also in this group are caregivers and loved ones. Um, we will learn about their preferences, um, needs, barriers, and strengths for adapting the safety planning intervention. And we're also learning from healthcare professionals who can provide who can help us decide on what can and cannot be changed um, about the safety planning intervention. So together, this group is the Arkansas Safety Planning Intervention Workgroup, and it's made up of nine community experts and three healthcare professionals. And we've actually had a really good um, retention of participants in this project, um, and it, which has been very helpful and beneficial. So. Um, and we've we've been our work group meetings are co-led by one academic member and one community expert um, from the research team, and they're all from the research team. So we've also had uh, some accommodations uh, for this group that we considered. So really thinking about having um, the meetings at different times and days of the week and the community members decide on what those are. They decide on when to have um, in-person or virtual meetings and as well as how they would like to receive information. And like Dr. Ellison was saying, um, we've used a lot of different modalities um, and even asking people what they would prefer to use and they vote on that. Um, and it's been very helpful in communicating with the team. So to achieve AIM-2, the group work group meets monthly and community experts share their needs for um, safety planning intervention. So the healthcare professionals join some of the meetings to weigh in. 
And this was actually suggested by our community partners during the CBPR Scholars Program. And they really thought that the healthcare professionals should not attend the first few workgroup meetings. And this was to minimize um, power imbalances and maximize commu community contributions, which was um, part of what they learned through the CBPR um, modules. So as a work group, um, they decide on what core parts of the intervention should not be changed. And they also discuss what potential barriers and strengths are to deploying this in the community organizations. And a lot of the discussions that they've been having um, are around needs as well as considerations for peer training. Um, so that has been um, very interesting um, to learn from the group. And, as, and it helps with us planning for future projects. So one of the suggestions um, that came from the community as experts in the work group was to create anonymous surveys, um, which were added to, then added to the protocol. Um, so this um, anonymous surveys, they provide an option for participants to share their thoughts privately. There weren't any issues of necessarily um, being afraid of speaking up during the meetings, but it was just a preference. They would rather be able to, to submit that um, anonymous, anonymously. And uh, it also allowed for those who are not present at the work group meeting to provide their input and vote um, on these different decisions. So they do have to come to a consensus and we do this through you know, discussions as well as voting um, before making any of the adaptations. And Dr. Woodward had used um, a traffic light coding for the group to vote on any of these adaptations. So the red is do not make any changes. The yellow would be proceed, you can change, but proceed with caution. And then the green um, is okay to change, which is something that people could have a lot of freedom in changing. So an example of this would be um, a veteran with suicidal ideation must receive a copy of their safety plan. So that was a red light decision um, that they came to. And then, but how they receive that um, safety plan was, can be in any form. It could be printed out, they could take a picture of it, email it, et cetera. And um, that was kind of one of those green light decisions. And I think that has been very helpful, again, for making it easy for people to participate um, and provide their input. So um, our study progressed. Um, we've, um, we've completed, um, almost completed all of the 10 work group meetings. Um, conducting the qualitative data analysis concurrently, um, and at, we are currently identifying the barriers and facilitators with the group. Um, we're also exploring future collaborations um, with other groups that are working on very similar um, projects, so Empowered Veterans, as well as the recipients of that Governor's Challenge and the Arkansas Veter Veteran Coalition. So additional funding will be pursued to develop the training materials um, and to pilot the intervention. So, and we've been very fortunate um, with the help of the Center for Health Literacy, we have already developed a fact sheet about um, safety planning and that's available both in English and Spanish. And that was suggested by our um, group participants and really um, echo a lot of what Dr. Allison shared about the lessons learned and the takeaway. It's been a very share, uh, collaborative um, project. It has been a lot of work, um, but with continued discussions and, and being able to really get the input from people um, has been beneficial for the study overall. So these are some of the ways um, that we've used CBPR through our, um, through our partnership. So Dr. Br uh, Ray Brown is the co-PI with Dr. Woodward, and they really do uh, promote that sh shared decision-making. So none of the main decisions are uh, made without the input of our community experts. Um, they've been, the community experts have been involved in the entire process. So that includes developing the research focus, the research questions, providing input on the grants um, and the study, the protocol, um, as well as recruitment, co-facilitation, as well as co-leading the data collection. So as, and the work group has provided suggestions for adaptations, training considerations, improving the research process and barriers and strengths to implementing this in the community. So on the right, these are some of our team members. It was the first time that we had had a planning meeting in person since we've been operating since the pandemic. 
And then I just wanted to acknowledge um, TRI, especially the community engagement team and the CDPR participants. Um, Dr. Haynes and Ms. Anna Huff Davis were very helpful um, during the um, CDPR process as our mentors. Um, and I also wanted to um, really put a shout out to Dr. Eva Woodward. Woodward, she's her leadership um, in this initiative has been amazing. She's really modeled and internalized the CBPR core principles and values. And I think that has led to um, a really great project and just so in, um, happy and engaged, um, to be involved and engaged in this. Um, and Dr. Taines has talked a lot about how it's important to get involved in the community, um, especially when you're working on these types of projects. So the academic team has volunteered for several of the AFF funding events and service projects. And we were even able to recruit um, some of our core team members um, at the bike race in 2021. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Haynes. All right. I don't know how you just listen to those two presentations and you're not like so excited about community engagement and ready to get started. Um, so I, I'm already thinking that you're probably asking yourself, how in the world can I start doing community engagement in my own uh, work? And I'm glad you asked because I'm about to tell you. So first of all, um, you probably heard throughout there some great shout outs for TRI. So I want to make sure that you know our team. You do not have to start community engagement by yourself. In fact, we would love to be supported because we don't want you to jump into it by yourself. We want to be able to support you. So please get to know our community engagement team at TRI. Um, I am the director, but Kanisha Brian Moore is the associate director. But the people who really have the expertise and do the work are our program managers, that's Nikki Spencer and Sarah Fountain, our program co coordinator, Ginger Morgan, and our community liaison, who I said has a, a doctorate degree in community, is Ms. Anna Huff Davis. She has over 30 years of experience in working with community partners and close to like 20 years of experience with working with researchers. She knows what she's talking about when she's talking about in community engaged research. So she's really an asset to our team and she's uh, always willing to reach out and help someone. So this is a team and I'm gonna give you a few ways that you can get some support um, if you're interested in community engagement. So we have services that we provide at TRI that includes our consultations. We can connect you with partners. Uh, we do technical assistance for our community advisory boards, community review boards, our equipment library, and then we do capacity building for how you can do community engaged research. So first, our consultations, you can go to our website and there we have a TRI portal and you can request those services. But that is when you get to meet with um, usually one of the directors plus one of our senior program managers and you tell us your idea or what you're doing or the grant you're thinking about going. And we talk about how can you get more community engagement in there. Um, if you're having some challenges, you already have a grant, you're saying, I want to engage. I've been trying to do X, Y, and Z. It's not working. We can do, troubleshoot some of those things. And we can uh, also give you that technical advice on community advisory boards doing those consultations. Those are typically an hour. Um, but if you need additional consultations after that, we can accommodate that usually. Um, you may want a community advisory board. Both of our projects talked about their committees and community advisory boards. Um, and those seem really like, oh, great to have, but you, they take a lot of time and a lot of effort. So if you say, you know what, I really want to get some advice and ongoing advice, but I don't really have the capacity right now to do my own project-specific cab, uh, we do have a cab uh, that's a part of our TRI. And you can request to come speak to our CAB. We have quarterly meetings with them and they can um, do re review your research proposals. We ask you to do a presentation about your research and then have some specific ideas that you uh, questions you want to ask them. And they can give you that information. And these are people who uh, love to communicate and they're passionate about their community. So when you come, be prepared for them to ask you all types of questions and to give you all types of things that you should be doing. But they really uh, are going to help you with making sure that your proposal is relevant to the community and that your recruitment strategies and your how you disseminate are going to be relevant and useful. Um, again, also, if you can't make one of our in-person me uh, quarterly meetings because you have more of a time sensitive thing, we do have sub subcommittee reviews where we will invite two, three or four of our CAB members to meet with you, talk about your research and give you that feedback. So if you want everybody that's at the quarterly meetings, but if you're like, three to four people can work, um, then we can do a subcommittee review. And you can also email one of us or go to our website and uh, make a request through the portal. 
We um, also provide our community review boards. Those are more of the one-time, uh, similar to what a focus group is like, but it's a one-time session and you can gain uh, information from community members. You can do this at any part of your process. Um, lots of people do it before they even go into the research project to make sure that certain things that they're proposing actually make sense and uh, will work and are relevant and important. Um, but we do have people who, when you meet a challenge, say, hey, I, these recruitment materials are this way I'm doing it is not working and I need to think about what I can do differently. So we can help you set that up. We'll recruit people for you. We'll have a one-time meeting. You'll come, uh, you'll share a little bit about your project and then our uh, program managers will facilitate the rest of the meeting and you receive a written report about the suggestions from the community review board. If you need some equipment to go out into the community, uh, we have some of that. Uh, Jen used the word, rent and rent is very you uh, kind of doesn't mean money so these are free resources but you do have to sign them out uh, so we have laptops and projectors and tables when you're doing in-person things but we also have things like hot spots though that you can use if you're trying to engage people from different areas and so if you are looking for something and you haven't written it to your grant and you need it for community engagement reach out to us and see if we have something that we're able to loan out at the time and so um I'm gonna move quickly through this, but again, all of this stuff, you if you wanna request it, you go through the TRI portal for request services and you can get that. Um, allow us some time, don't, you know, if you need it tomorrow, don't be like this afternoon uh, request it, but give us some time to really think about it. We'll be able to uh, usually help you get those requests uh, handled. And then we have our capacity building programs. The first one is our Community Scientist Academy. And this is usually for our community members and patients and we train them on what research. So it's really a research 101. What is research? What are the types of researchers that we do here at UAMS and how can they get involved? And so if you have community partners or people that you want to engage in research, but they've never been engaged before, this is a great way to get started. And so we can do tailored information for uh, specific participants. So we have a veteran specific CSA, we have a, a CSA for faith leaders. So we can tailor that information. If that's something you want, please contact us and we will be able to tell you if we already have something that exists or how long it would take for that to be modified. But there was small groups and our community partners really enjoy getting this so that when they feel more comfortable when they're talking to you about research, when you use some research design and you say quantitative versus qualitative, and they're like, oh yeah, I know exactly what that is. So if you're wanting to work with someone and they haven't been involved, this is a great way to give them that foundation information before they get started on your project. Um, we also have our CPRO uh, program, and this is specifically for organizational leaders and helping them build capacity to be able to partner. So um, we worked with community organizations such as Our House um, and some other ones that are on the next slide, but they get uh, some mentoring and they get consultation and they get an opportunity to do a project. So they actually have experience do with doing research and projects. So when you're ready to engage, they bring that to the table with you. And then... Um, everyone today, Dr. Allison and Ms. Gann, we're talking about the CBPR Scholar Program. So if you heard that and you said, this sounds amazing, I don't know a lot about CBPR and I want to do it, you are in luck because we are currently uh, taking applications for our second cohort. And that deadline is February 1st. And if you're looking at that and you're saying, that is too quick, I can't get anything done. This is not an application like an NIH application where you're writing 12 pages of a research proposal. You're actually writing about yourself and your community partner is writing about themselves too. So if you have a community partner and you've been talking about doing something together, but you haven't had a chance to do it yet, this is a great time to think about that. If you want a new party, you got an idea, but you don't have a partner, contact us as soon as possible because we sometimes have community partners that we can partner with you. If you've been doing community engaged research before, but you have a new partnership you're looking about to get off the ground, this is also a great opportunity. So don't miss out on this cohort so that you can, next time we do this presentation, be one of the people talking about how amazing CBPR is and how it's changed uh, how you do your work. I do just wanna shout out some of our uh, CPRO organizations before I quit. And so, like I said, Our House, BCD, um, the Arkansas Prostate Cancer Foundation, these are all organizations who have gone through our capacity training and uh, have uh, understanding of what research is, but also how they can do a project so they've increased their capacity to be able to partner. And then for our CBPR Scholars Program, um, again, it's a, it's a one-year commitment, which sounds like a lot, but it really is an opportunity for you to take a long time to kind of really get that pilot pro proposal together, learn about each other, and learn about CBPR. And so, um, again, if you're interested in that, that application is coming up soon, go to our website or email one of our team members for more information. So please, uh, this is our email information right here. 
I will tell you it's going to be much faster for you to email uh, Nikki and Sarah, but feel free to email me. I will be happy to help you get started with any of our TRI services. And so I think that's it, it for us here, but we will have some time for some questions if people have them. Thank you all so much. Um, I just want to say, I mean, this was fabulous. This was our most requested topic um, for Grand Rounds in our departmental survey was asked to hear about community-based participatory research and community-based research efforts. And y'all have done a fabulous job kind of providing some introduction and some really applied examples. Um, I just wanted to offer a quick reflection as folks, um, as you think of questions, put them in the chat or get ready to unmute yourself. Um, for me, this has been such a process of discovering such a different way to do research. Um, I think it's hard, maybe even hard to imagine as you hear about it, but um, like, you know, as was illustrated in both Dr. Allison's and Jen's presentations, we're talking about, you know, not just walking in somewhere and saying like, hi, I'm a researcher and I want to do X with you. <laughs> We're talking about lots of meetings with lots of people to define priorities together, to make decisions together, like down to like we pick our incentives <laughs> together with our participants. Um, what, uh, you know, uh, what they see as the thing that they want to implement. Um, TRI helped me set up uh, my community advisory board that Dr. Allison referenced and literally walked me through the process of like, how do I like get MOUs with community members? How do I determine what adequate compensation is for their time and expertise? And I recently got a grant funded by Procori where I think something like 35% of the budget is going to community members um, to compensate them for their time and expertise and guiding us in the project. And so I wouldn't have been able to do that without um, these programs. And it is, it's just such a different way of doing research. And I hope people bite on learning more about it from some of the programs that Dr. Haynes just described. So those are uh, my quick reflections. I don't know if we've had any questions come in in the chat or uh, if anyone has any questions, please unmute yourself now as well. Andy, I saw your hand, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. And by the way, I'm just gonna put a survey link uh, in the chat right quick for feedback. Um, so love the presentations of Dr. Dr. Dan, really love the approach uh, that you presented on of taking the suicide prevention models from the VA clinic and extend them to the community. But my question is actually for Dr. Allison, are there opportunities to do that with your research? Like, do you follow outcome measures when uh, your participants uh, re-enter society and are there ways to like mirror this with like say probation officers or other uh, community individuals outside the prison setting? Mm -hmm. So with our current project, we're not currently doing that, um, but we're hoping that this will just be the first of our you know many collaborations or many research projects with this team and with this setting. So you know we we uh, started not necessarily small, but, you know, I, I don't know that education would have been our focus if Dr. Zlinski and I were just sitting in an office and decided what project to do together. Um, it was a priority set by our, our committee. And so, you know, when we come back and start to think about next steps for projects, um, that might be one of them, right? That might be an, a priority and they want to know whether or not if a, a jail, you know, staff gets educated, does that lead to better outcomes for the folks that are detained there, for the officers that work there? And um, so working with those, those facilities that we now have really great relationships with um, to collect that data, because, you know, we would never want to just walk in and say, hi, I'm Dr. Allison, I would like to have access to your data, right? And, but, but forming the relationships with them over time is, is really critical and and working towards doing those larger scale projects. So I hope that answers your question. And as an example of that capacity building, like during that AIM-1 survey that Katie presented with the 65 jails, like we collected like who's interested in continuing to partner on this. And now we essentially have a whole bunch of people that we have a sense of whether or not this is a priority for them in the future that we could build off of. Got lots of shout outs in the comments. Um, we've got time for uh, at least one additional question if anyone has one. I think that means everyone's making their portal request right now to get their <laughs> services so they can start doing um, community engaged work. I'm excited to see it. 
And Nikki and Sarah are phenomenal, the the folks that work with the community engagement team. And Dr. Haynes, we could not have done this without your mentorship. I I cannot say enough good things about the community engagement group with TRI because you're, you know, the expertise that we got from from those consultations uh, was so helpful in making sure that we had a, a strong project, had strong research aims, strong methods. So, and they're very approachable. Please reach out to Nikki or Sarah or anyone on the team at any time because they are so great. Dr. Haynes, was I accidentally sharing my um, screen and I didn't realize it because I am on the TRI portal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just felt it. I felt it that that's what was going on. So I'm excited. <laughs> to see what your request is and how we can help you. <laughs> All right, well, if there are no additional questions, I think that'll conclude our rounds presentation uh, for today. So thank you everybody for being here and I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you. Thanks y'all. Take care. Good to see you, everybody. <laughs>